This is Tyrannus Acre Forward, the ag industry's most thought-provoking podcast. Listen to interesting people as we go in-depth into the issues affecting crop advisors, growers, and farm communities. Uncovering the truth about the ag business and using technology to prepare for the unforeseeable. Ready to explore the future? Let's dig in. I'm pleased to introduce Leah Beyer of Corteva, uh, who is a communications and marketing professional. Leah, welcome to our podcast today. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me today. No, it's absolutely a pleasure. I've known you for a little while, and it's it's really great to bring you on. I think we're going to have a pretty good discussion today. So for the retailers and advisors or anyone interested in marketing and communications, uh, I want them to get to know you and your expertise. And we're going to talk about maybe the do's and don'ts or the best practices or what we've seen just in this area. And you think about retail, like they, they're providing a lot of services, whether you're a retailer or a dealer, you have products, but you also have service and differentiation to think about. So we're going to dive into that today. But before we do that, can you just tell us who are you and what is your background? Absolutely. Well, I'm a farm girl at heart. I grew up in East Central Illinois um, on a small dairy farm, but both sides of my family were diversified, both crop and livestock farmers. So ag is in my roots. Uh, my dad was a large animal veterinarian, though, um, wanted to do more in that profession. So my brother now has taken over my family farm that was actually settled in 1901. Um, when my German ancestors came over it in East Central Illinois, they got some really low land that needed some field tile, and the Germans knew how to do field tile. tile. So over in Iroquois County, um, my family laid some of the first tile, and my brother still lives on that original farm place my family settled. So pretty cool story and legacy there. Um, he continues to grow uh, corn and soybeans, wheat, hay, and then also raise cattle. So cattle are, are in my blood. I went on um, to lean the farm and work in the ag industry, but not be a farmer. But, you know, sometimes destiny has a way of coming for you. So I, I moved to Indiana after I got to grad school to actually be a 4-H educator and met and married my farmer here in the Hoosier State. So I have been working off the farm um, since getting married and made my way to the digital marketing space when I realized that people who hate agriculture were attacking us online and agriculture didn't even know what was happening. It was like all the antis, whether it was PETA, whether it was the environmentalists, they hated Monsanto, they hated GMOs, they hated factory farming. And I sort of had this epiphany back in 2009 where I was like, we've got to get in the game and we've got to start, quote unquote, telling our story. Um, and so I learned the the tools of the trade, so to speak. Like, I like to say I'm a content queen. I know the right content for the right audience. So then I had to learn, how do you put it in the right space so people on Google or people on Twitter could find you when they're looking for you? And so my career sort of evolved from being more in the nonprofit association space to hardcore, let's get into the digital marketing space. Let's start penetrating through all the riffraff, all the negativity, and start putting our information out there, which made me an invaluable resource. Um, to, at the time, Alenco Animal Health brought me in to really help them understand how can they, as a highly regulated pharmaceutical company, play in the digital space? Because we've all seen the TV commercials, we've all seen the ads for anything pharmaceutical, not just animal health. They have all this, hey, you could take this pill, but it might kill you, or it might, you know, turn your... Right. And purple. And so they're like, how do we do this? And I was able to sort of crack that nut and figure out how can we do it, really um, get into launching that digital marketing space within the animal industry, but then also help our producers, the largest feedlot um, owners in the country. How do they tell their story about raising 200,000 head of cattle Yes, in the Panando of Texas, same with pigs, but then also veterinarians who are small animal that how do they help their customers who sometimes don't have the budget to do but they do have the heart to do what's right for their pets um from there i sort of evolved and went back um to my first love which was the crop space and now today i'm leading the digital marcom team for the entire u.s business over at corteva 
including the Pioneer brand, our regional seed brands, our CP brands, as well as pasture land management, um, as well as pest management and turf and ornamental. So lots of fun things over at the Corteva business. And we're able to tell very different stories. We're able to market in ways that are very unique to who our customers are. Because let's just be honest, the customer for an almond tree farmer in California is very different than and my brother. We're an almond tree farmer. That you're very true, very true. <laughs> Birds is my brother who's still raising um, corn and soybeans with that Pioneer brand over in Illinois. So you've got you've got a lot of experience, and you farmed in both Illinois and Indiana, which yep. you know that's pretty diverse for many. And then you it think is. about. So I had a lot of questions because when you talk about advocating for the space that we're in, one thing that I can't help but think about my history was with Syngenta, so another brand that was created from two words, right? Bringing people yep. together, Latin and Greek roots. Yep. I'll have you explain Corteva here in a, in a minute, because I'm sure some people still want to know where that came from and what that looks like. But I think back to those 2000s, and if you remember GMOAnswers.com? Oh, yeah. Yep. And just advocating in that space. I, I remember protesters coming onto campus and destroying things. They And that's what the media gets, is they're protesting GMOs. They're not there the next day when the guy who's also farming, who also does maintenance at Syngenta, is cleaning off the graffiti and fixing the damage that's been done. And I say that right. because I think a lot of folks are disconnected from the rural population and how feed, food, energy, uh, and crops are grown. And we need to advocate for ourselves. And even within the tech industry, you see people coming in. There's a mentality historically of, Efficiency, removing middleman, retailers and dealers don't get along with basics like Corteva. But when you work in it, you start to realize the zip code, the county, all the things that people live and work to do together, these are tight, tight bonds. And so we need to do a better job advocating, though, because we're a smaller segment of the population. And that's not changing for the in, in our lifetime. So when you think about that, yeah, so when you think about that, how are you... So first, where does Corteva come from? And second, how is Corteva kind of helping advocate for the rural community? Absolutely. So Corteva was the merger of Pioneer DuPont yes. and then Dow AgriSciences. And then the name you've already alluded to is the combination of two words, for and Teva, heart and nature. So um, a lot of people, even internally, I'll, we kid about, can't even say Corteva right. We hear a lot of Corteva because people wear sandals that are called Tevas, which we're all saying it wrong. It's Tevas. They're Tevas. Teva. So, yeah. So we are Corteva. Um, and really at the heart of it is nature. So not only how are we helping farmers, how are we helping um, even golf course superintendents grow the best products um, or keep those pests away from hurting our growing things. How can we help protect those growing things? And you nailed it. At the heart of it is the rural community. It doesn't matter um, if you're buying our Centricon system, but you live in Atlanta. You're still impacting the rural community because those those folks are eating. They're buying stock. They're all the things that impact the rural community. So at the heart of everything we do is that farmer and the impact that farmer has on their community. So how can we prop them up to be successful, not just for this generation, but for the further generation? Um, because without the farmer staying there and giving back to their community, what do we have? Because at the end of the day, there's going to be more consolidation. There's going to be fewer farmers, but we still need those farmers to live and participate in their communities. And that's where, um, on the pioneer side, that's why our agent network is so important because our reps that are selling Pioneer seed corn, they live and breathe in their yeah. communities. They're they're the ones sponsoring the baseball team. They're making sure that the church's um, yearly picnic is being sponsored. They're providing, sometimes behind the scenes, to those FFA chapters, those 4-H clubs, to make sure that those kids realize where they come from, have the support to go on and do great things and become our future leaders. So absolutely um, important to us as we think about our entire business and how it's not just about today, but the longevity. 
Yeah, I, I, I totally see that and I agree. You, you talk about technology changes how we advocate and communicate. I think that's yep. probably one of the first types of revolution that the internet and digital tech, and we're probably both of age to see that happen in our lifetime. What's now changing is even the ability, like what we do, to scout at high resolution, do things that we're done okay with the means that we had up until now. But even the last three years, we've seen such a change in energy storage, battery. Look at the vehicles that are on the road. Absolutely. It affects what you put in the air. The ability to do, we do artificial intelligence. That makes things cheaper, easier to analyze. So we're changing how people eat can interact, serve, understand their crop. So I was thinking about your background in marketing and comms. I was thinking about sometimes our audience, I'll get some questions after these things about how we do what we do or why we do the things that we do. And what I'm noticing is what's different about, what are the challenges that come to communicating an ad? Whether you're a basic, an input provider, retailer, going to a grower, having that farm background, what are the principles of marketing that you think in good comms apply here? And what are the differences for our industry? So there's, we sort of live in this weird dichotomy where we have some of the most innovative people in the world in the yes. industry. Some of the smartest, um, most innovative folks I know are farmers living in rural communities. And they all tend to have one major obstacle, and that is connectivity. So while they are the most forward thinking, they're creating new things. They're making things work that an engineer sitting in yeah. Silicon Valley can't figure out how to make work. They're they're figuring out how to do that in Onarga, Illinois. However, because of the lack of broadband and internet, we sometimes have to figure out how do we get the information. So to your point, you have very high res imagery. Like you can count the spots on a ladybug yeah. from your imagery. But if the farmer can't don't let us download that picture because his internet isn't fast enough, th there's no value. So in the marketing and comm space, we have to figure out how to get the right message that can be found at the right time to the farmer to deal with whatever opportunity or obstacle they're facing that time, knowing they may not have fast internet and knowing that they're looking for the answer on the internet. Let's just be honest. It doesn't matter if it's people our age in our 40s or it's people in their 60s or people in their 20s, they go to the internet first. It's not the first thing to pick up the phone and call someone with a question. They're like, hey, I can Google this. That's right. So it's making, it's making sure that when they ask the question, we give them the answer. So we've almost shifted to, okay, we know what our key messages are. We know our value props. We know why our product differentiated. Majority of the time, our customers or our prospects are finding us on Google. If you can't find us on Google, we don't exist because they can see an ad. We can mail them a piece of information. We can email them. But at the end of the day, it's all about the Google and answering their question at the right time. Once we get them, then we can continue building that loyalty, that trust, and continuing to deliver their answer in a low bandwidth way to answer their question. Just like you guys might have to figure out how to do. How do we tell them you've got a problem out on this back 40? Even if you can't download the highest resolution, how do you how do you make that resolution smaller so they can download it fast and know exactly where to go in that field to answer that question? It's I all about serving agree. them. Yeah, and that's what's nice is tech is changing so so much that we've been good at doing that and compressing and finding ways. But that's another reason that the advisor or your dealer network or your agent network is so valuable because, yep, a grower is going to search on Google, but we also know how complex this environment and this situation is when it comes to farming and inputs and things like that. So we want to help facilitate the right connection. But from my point of view, I see that the advisor is still going to be indispensable for the, a lot of the reasons you just mentioned, because I could, I could Google something about a hybrid that I care about from Pioneer. Absolutely. But. And the, they Google it. They, they get a question and then they go have a bush light with their pioneer rep and ask, what about this hybrid? I Googled something, found it online. What do you know? They might be it's drinking a last bush light because of the parent company these days, but. You're right. You're right. It's, okay. Coors light. They're drinking. That's a good light. example though. No, I, I agree with you. And so we, we were thinking about just how advisors, how that role has changed. 
So maybe I'm kind of pivoting a little bit here, but yeah, we think about good advisors, whether you're a seed dealer or a retailer, you're serving growers, you're a consultant. I think about the basics of relationships and to have a relationship, you know, you have to, you have to be dedicated to someone. You have to want to serve someone. You got to care about them. You got to love them, which means you got to know them. And so I know what we're doing. And, and I think a lot of the things that your company does is by just knowing the customer better, which creates concern, care, which creates motivation in an organization or an individual, which creates the kind of service you want. Tell me a little bit about how Corteva and your brands and how the company looks at knowing the customer and creating that differentiation through good service, right? Because it's more, you have good products. I think everybody agrees yep. to that. What's, but how do you know your customers and how do you really differentiate? You know, this, the word advisor, I think, is key here. And so some of our most successful long-term relationships with customers, here they they go to church with their sales rep. Doesn't matter if it's on uh, the retail rep or their pioneer rep. But there's another component to that relationship, and that is the advisor. And in our in our instance, a lot of times it's the agronomist. Our company's agronomists, both on the CP side of the business and on the seed side of the business, are the ones that our customers look at when they're having an issue. Well, what's Mark Jeske say? What does, you know, and they trust them because People like Mark have gotten into the field. They have dug deep into the soil. They have looked at the plant. They have answered the question. Word has gotten out, hey, if you have this problem, you want you want to know what Mark's saying. To the point where now we're like, how do we make sure Mark's messages get to more people because he is that trusted advisor? And if something's not going right, Mark's going to speak up and say, this isn't, this isn't working the way we want it. This is how we're adjusting. And we listen to the concern and we do make those adjustments. But first you've got, you literally, so, so to speak, have to break ground with these people. You have to show them that you're willing um, to get on their level. You're willing to go to where they are and help them unpack their opportunities, but also when they're facing challenges, that you stick with them. You're not just there on the good day. So from our standpoint, we are, constantly using our advisors internally and then even partnering with external advisors to help farmers understand the changing dynamics of growing corn and soybeans. You know, tar spot was something we never talked about, what, five years ago? That now, now that's all we talk about. So our genetics, how do we prevent tar spot? If you get tar spot, how do, you know, how do we use something like approach prima to get rid of it? Your, your business is going to tell the farmer, we see a problem because your technology can see the problem before a human can see it. Um, so it's just, but again, they're not going to believe you if they don't trust you. And I think, yeah. And I think trust is about knowing more being there. And so what I'm hearing about Corteva and, and particularly, I know one of the main brands I think about, you have many is Pioneer is, and for the audience that listens to this that doesn't come from agriculture, if you come from tech, other areas, what's puzzling is because it makes sense when you understand the dynamics, but to be good in this industry, you have to have knowledgeable, professional, expert people in the geography that understand what's happening because this is a complex thing to do. It's not easy to grow a good crop. It's not easy to protect it. It's not easy to preserve your legacy and your farm even the way cash flow works for a farmer Absolutely. and the wealth that's that's there, but it's tied up, you have to perform season after season. So it's, it, I do, but I do have a lot of respect for Corteva and its people and, and Pioneer and the brands that are there. I worked with it as a competitor with Syngenta. I worked with it as a customer, obviously at Southern States. And then here at Tyrannus, we do a lot of business with folks that work with Corteva and Pioneer. And it's it's good to see how we can help just illustrate that story, right? Because we don't we don't replace an advisor. We're getting over that acre saying, we can give you a stand count. People say, what does that mean? I counted my plants. What it means is you have the first indication of the potential of that acre, and now you can optimize your activities, your resources for the rest of the season. But at the end of the season, you like that Pioneer Hybrid. You like that Approach Prima with Picoxy Strobin has a little bit of curative and reach back for you, and you, you put it in at the right time on your beans and you start going through this, you have game tape where you said this was the right decision. 
So I think too often we see technology, whether it's communications or ag tech, is competitive to what people are doing rather than an enabler. I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but I always wonder why that's the case. Like, why do we see these things at odds with each other versus an enabler that brings people together? Well, you have to change your mindset. So okay. if you are just trying to sell more, name the thing. So if you're just trying to sell more fungicide, then technology might scare you because you might actually see where you don't need to sell more. That's but right. that's where the magic happens because you're not doing all the time what's going to benefit you. It's what's benefiting the customer. And when you fo stop focusing on just selling a widget or just selling a product or just selling a bag of seed and focus on what the customer needs, today to be successful this year in this growing season they're going to see that they're going to feel that they're going to be emotional about it because maybe you took a hit because you didn't sell as much but you did the right thing for them which means that they're going to be a repeat customer because now they trust you and You're that not... saves you a lot right because what's a good retention rate maybe pioneer is right. better than this but in general my memory is that you've got churn in the seed business alone at 20 percent a year if you're decent like there's high chirp and there's reasons for it, right? Absolutely. People buy from three input providers, keep them modest to have choices because they're related to half of them. You know, it's a small Absolutely. community and you have to work together. But at the end of the day, you're not selling a bag of seed. You're not selling a, you're, you're helping them get to an output. But sometimes the outcome that they get, do we all understand even what that outcome is properly for that farm? Right. Exactly. So boots on the ground is a big part of understanding that. And I think technology is just helping boots on the ground cover more ground and be better. Absolutely. And that's where technology complements what you're doing, doesn't compete. Because, you know, from our standpoint, Pioneer likes to tout on, we have the best tar spot resistance. Well, your product can prove that for us. We're not going to say we don't need a product to look. We're, we're like, yeah, go look. You'll see what we tell you that we're promising. So if you're an agent or you're a retailer, you do good work. Are you showing it off? Because exactly. that's one thing about our tools is we can show you everything that's wrong on an acre. And that's how we're conditioned as humans to see what's an outlier, right? To survive, to see what's wrong. Yep. But what really the value in our service and what you're saying as an advisor, we can actually show you what worked so you can repeat it and improve. Exactly. I think we can forget that. So uh, that, that probably happens in marketing co communications as well, right? You probably see a lot what's wrong instead of what's working. Oh, absolutely. And we love, especially in the ag industry, we love to attack each other. Don't buy that unsaid brand because look, that brand wilt in the heat or it's not drought resistant or, oh, look at that weed killer. It didn't actually kill the weeds like it said it would. We love to find the worst patch that has a sign by you know, name our competitor. Yeah, yeah. See, that we didn't tell. I mean, constantly, we're all, you know, marketers are coming to me saying, hey, we need to change our website and show that, you know, Roundup's not working and they need to all move to Enlist or Dicamba's not working. We need to all move to Enlist. Right. Well, why don't we just show off what's what you're doing? Work? Right. Let's yeah. show what's working because they can probably find bad pictures about Enlist too, I'm sure. Well, there's but a lot of factors that goes happen. into applying anything. Exactly. So how exactly. do you, and that's, again, I'm not plugging what we do, but how do you keep everybody honest and know what's going on? Game tape does it. I mean, if you have Acre Forward Intelligence, we see it. We're not telling you what happened. We're telling you what we see. And the right. advisors, but I agree with you. I think the positive messages, they're not short-term satisfying, but in the long term, when people see the benefits to say Enlist brings, you can make mistakes with all these products. That's why they have all these labels oh. and warnings and advisors and licenses. But at the end of the day, we don't help ourselves in the ag industry pointing out the 1%, half percent mistake and tying it to a brand because it's one community, it's one effort. And it you live by the sword, you die by the sword, right? So exactly. you got to go after Dicamba, the same arguments, maybe slightly different, can come Add in list. I know I'm I'm getting into some trouble waters yeah. here, but these tools are very valuable tools for for people to use. What I like about what we're able to do is we're not writing the story, we're illustrating it. But you can show the good work you're doing, the folks in the city, to the folks in the value chain. Like you can show the advice. You can actually 
have people be part of your story on the farm and at retail. But I want to go back to something that you said that kind of, it hits me every time I think about this, I think about the last 20 years mm-hmm. and technology and venture capital and tech. You said we attack each other in agriculture. Now, I didn't come from ag to begin with, a related industry, but I've been doing this in the ag sector since the early 2000s. And when I first got into corn and soy, because I actually did almonds and almonds and other trees, nuts, and vines before I got into this, what struck me was it's a special and it's a wholesome industry, and I love being part of it. But somebody said, what's it like to work seed dealers, retail? I don't even know if I should say this, but I said, I'm trying to give you an example as a, as a friend of mine, like I could give you. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows everything. Everybody's related to everybody. So it's a combination between like a lot of old ladies and the mafia. Like everybody's, you know, everything. there's always kind of connections. People are skeptical, but they all get along and it's a big family. Probably not the best example. But when I looked at tech coming in at Syngenta, I had a different chair. So I was more focused on the crop protection and the seed. So you watch these entrants come in, and I won't name them. I think many of them tried to disrupt and did good things, but it was always on the underlying premise was this technology is going to remove a middleman. This technology is going to remove someone who's taken too much of your pie. It was almost set up by design to be adversarial. Like you should not trust your retailer because Leah, did you know? Mike pays a little less for his seed than you do. And I start, but I get why people see that. But what we understood, and I think what your audience knows and my audience knows is very simple. These are people that work together and there's a lot of dynamics that goes into pricing, right? So there's really oh, not yeah. autonomy between even Corteva, the retailer and the grower. It's all one community and team that's working together to preserve a way of life and, and create crops and have a good outcome. So do you see that changing? Do you think there's more awareness of this? Or do you still see the adversarial kind of instinct uh, within the ag community? Um, I I think by nature, humans like to be competitive. So I think we're still going to see some adversarial type things. But I think COVID changed some outlook. Because we had this slight um, logistic supply chain issue over the last three years. Like... You might be very loyal to your rep or your quote unquote brand or the, to your point, the three brands you use. But at the end of the day, you need product to kill the weeds in the field this growing season. And you got to the point where you would just, you had to look a human in the eyes and be like, I don't care what you can get me, get me in. And some of these disruptors in the industry who really tried to say that retailer, he's a bad guy, were wrong because they couldn't deliver. Right. For that farmer. They couldn't like they couldn't figure out in California how to deliver for someone in Onarga, Illinois. But the nutrient rep in Onarga, Illinois knew how to deliver for the farmer yeah. in Onarga, Illinois. And so what I think has evolved from that is even though like farmers still are gonna be misers of their pennies and they want a product that is they want it the lowest price, the most effective, yeah. and then they you know, they want to sell their corn at the highest peak in the market. None of that's going to change. However, they have now even more come to realize that that advisor is going to show up and deliver for them at that retailer, um, whether it's their consultant. And so the competition of you're bad and this is good has sort of changed and evolved. Now, I think as COVID goes in the rear view, that could change and evolve and more people come in and more people are trying to disrupt, especially as the economy is doing some crazy things right now. But like always, the ag's going to be steady, Eddie, because we're going to continue to have to eat and clothe ourselves and fuel our cars. And so there's going to be even more people like, how can I go make a dime on the farmer's back? How can I disrupt and point out, oh, those those local people, they're not as smart as I am, even though they're new to the industry. So I, I'm i hoping that it, it gets better, but I think by nature, we're still all competitive. So I think that makes a lot of sense. I think for me, I think it's very simple. I think if you look at the actions with people, that connection between the retailer or the agent or the dealer and the farmer, it's really close. I I benefited when I had Golden Harvest as a brand and as a sales territory. 
seeing how the dealers would work and get up. These are the same folks that had a side job making sure the salt was on the road at 3 a.m. so you could get safely yep. to the hospital. And these are the people, our communities are people that make sure things are working, that people are fed, that they're safe, that their power works. So I really, I think more people are understanding that as we come into it. And some of the disruption of tech is moving into more of an acceptance of, okay, how do we use this to work together? Because retail exists in part to just move big, heavy piles into smaller piles. So there's a logistics game that you have to deal with. But the ones that I see winning, Leah, I can name a few, like just good retailers and cooperatives. I'm seeing there's probably two sets. There's the order taker, tin shed. I got a low price. I've got an excess. I brokered something. Here you go. And then there's the cooperative or retailer, or independent retailer or integrated, whichever, because each location is different. But I even see stuff like Landis Co-op and Matt Carson yeah. leading that and watching the progressive solutions they're bringing. I think we should just bet on the people that are going to drive changes and provide service and meet the needs for the growers in their area. And I, I sat in one of their audiences and I heard him talking about how to help the farmers that they serve in the cooperative with healthcare and get involved with legislation and the government, how to help with preserving the family farm and making good investments to keep it in the family, how to do things like protect your IP and be part of yep. the technology. And these are not things you think about. But their services are changing. I, I don't know how much you've seen of that, but I'm starting to see a lot more progressive uh, approaches to, pr- to protecting what we do and how we do it at retail and cooperatives. I think it's encouraging, but it's not something you would have seen 10 years ago. No, it's not, because they would have said, that's not my problem. But right. now they're looking at it as, if it's my customer's problem, it is my problem. And I, what I like about that is, is, if it's not us, I shouldn't. we shouldn't have to do this. But if not us, who? Who? And that really struck a chord with me because I thought, okay, yeah, if not us, who? So I do think there's an attitude change, or maybe it's just I'm seeing it, where I see farmers and advisors and even the large companies like Corteva coming closer together to make sure that we're producing the food and the feed and the outputs that our nation and the world depend on. Well, I think I even think of people like Beth Ford at Lando Lakes who are doing a huge rural broadband initiative. Like, why the heck does Lando Lake care about rural broadband? And why is this a big initiative for a CEO of a butter company? Well, we all know Lando Lakes has more than just butter, but because she realizes those folks raising the cattle, right. raising the corn and soybeans, that's why she has a butter business. And if they can't connect to the internet, the next generation is not coming home. No, that's another great example. Like, and I'm seeing, I think some of the consolidation and the input side and the retail side, and even at the farm side is starting to settle down. And I, you'll still see it, but I really see companies changing what they're offering and how they're solving problems. So to put you on the spot, as you think about Corteva, how's Corteva faring in this? You know, what are what are some of the things Corteva is doing that people may not realize or is a little bit different than, you know, the Dow and DuPont and legacy brands of years ago? Well, I think sometimes we just get hung up on the the core brands of a major company. So for Corteva, you think of probably two things, Pioneer and Enlip. Um, But what you don't know about the Corteva brand, and honestly, when I came to Corteva, I thought Enlip, Pioneer, and I realized that we have the Bravat brand at the re- at the retailer and we have regional seed brands and I, I knew we did some stuff in pasture land management, but we are diving big into the biological space. Like okay. as people tone change about, okay, what does sustainability look like and how, what it, heaven forbid, we can't get our hands on um, nitrogen or we can't get our hands on a different type of fertilizer or a different kind of chemical. What are our alternatives that we can control our own destiny? What does this biological space look like? Um, the other thing is, is we have a very broad and deep horticulture business. So when I came on board, I think I was on the, the job two weeks, and they started talking about spinosis, which is one of our yeah. pesticides that, that we use. Yep. And I was like, wait a minute, I know spinosis. That's yep. what we used at Alenco in Flea and Tick. Yes. And they're like, yeah, we license it out. But sometimes you think, why Why do I care about a, a CP 
or um, seed company. Well, if you're a pet owner, you absolutely care about our R and D and how we're developing the next generation of the insecticide. Because right. it could be what you're using for your pet. Um, there's so much collaboration, so much research that's done in those spaces that you forget that what we're doing at at Corteva is impacting people who live in Chicago. And not just from a food perspective, just no, from a you, science perspective. You're 100 percent right, because we say technology, maybe it's circles I'm in too often. We think it's computer stuff all the time. Computer but coming from Syngenta and the same, very similar to Corteva, you know, the amount of R and D and discovery and molecule and the way it affects other things is really deep. It's amazing the connections to pharma, pharmaceuticals. It's Absolutely. amazing the connections to other things. When I go to the doctor, they'll laugh because, you know, I remember there was something, one of my kids, we were doing something and we were talking and I'm having a conversation with the doctor. I know the active, I had to be careful when I say AI to this audience because for you, it might mean what? Artificial insemination on the data side, right? It could mean active ingredient or it could mean artificial intelligence, but you know, yeah. using active ingredient, you know, conversations, in medicine, it's very similar to, to obviously animal health, but to the crop. So you mentioned 4-H and FFA. I'd be remiss if I didn't call out if anyone is listening to this and they're in high school or they have high schoolers. You think about the career for your kid. Those are pretty good things to start getting involved with because even if you don't go into farming, the science is good if you want to go to medical school, you want to be a nurse, you want to do other things with biology. So yeah, when you look at Corteva 4-H FFA, I'm assuming there's lots of involvement with your company. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we're all in on both those organizations. Um, proud sponsors of the National FFA Convention who comes to town every year. Um, we're also involved in smaller ways um, through local chapters. Um, we support our employees volunteering um, every quarter. We're given time off to go volunteer. We give of our riches as well to these organizations. But the other thing is we bring those kids and those youth into our building. So just a few weeks ago, we had um, Hamilton Southeastern High School has an FFA chapter. So here in Fishers, um, Indiana, yep. all these city kids are taking FFA and they might become some of the next best researchers. They don't live on a farm, but they've somehow been intrigued by agriculture and they're coming and learning about our R and D they're learning about marketing. They're learning about data and analytics and how do we take data and use it to see where there's a need anomalies, where there's a gap. So that way R and D can use it to develop the next um, generation of innovative products. So I am continually impressed with the organization and Corteva continues to invest um, both time, their people and their money into those organizations to make sure that the future is bright for agriculture. I, I think it's fantastic. I think about my daughter. My daughters go to Western High in Rucheville, Indiana, and they just had a crop consultant come in with a drone to show them yeah. what they do with the drone. And, and we do some of that with the amount of math and artificial intelligence and science. So it's just a neat world today where depending on what your gifts are and your interests are, there's a way for you to work and serve in rural America and you don't have to go you can, but you don't have to go away to a big city. You can you can use your talents and you can actually be part of a an agricultural community. In most of our counties, and you know, maybe hospitals, we think of them as our biggest employers. It's actually the farmers. If you look at all the farmers together, the biggest employer, the biggest uh concern for that county is the ag community and what farmers and ranchers are doing. So it's just a good reminder. And I think for the audience here I want to call out and you should go if you're not part of 4-H and FSA and it's of interest to you, you should be looking into that. We have groups in Indiana like Agronovus that's bringing business to Indiana. So I do need to plug that. I'll say hi to Mitch Frazier and the crew, but FFA is headquartered here. There's a lot of Cortevas here in Indiana. We have Purdue. We do have companies like Elenco. We have Bex. I know it's not your brand up the road. Yeah. There's AgriLion here in town. So there's so much happening in Indiana. I think that's another call out. We, we chose this for a reason, but... It's because Indiana allows and actually promotes good work in rural communities, but also across the state to help accelerate ag. And so just curious, any thoughts on Indiana and Corteva before we wrap you, up? You know, I've already said I grew up in Illinois, which is a hot mess when it comes to yeah. being Chicago ran and downstate really paying the bill for all of this. 
Indiana is special because not only do we have a good environment for ag to thrive, we have leaders, both industry and elected, that bring ag to the table. When ag is not at the table, they're like, we're missing a vital and important piece of this conversation, and it's ag. So it doesn't matter if it's our governor. It doesn't matter if it's economic development. It doesn't matter if it's the Chamber of Commerce. They want ag at the table because they know it's part of the lifeblood. And with, without our strong ag sector, we don't have a strong business sector. I'm, I'm so glad you raised and you raised that and talked about it because I've lived in several states. And I, this is, I've moved to Indiana twice now for a reason. But I think it's well managed. I think there are differences. I think people from the outside probably look at it one way. There are a lot of differences. But I do see a state that works, people that work. We just had Don Lamb who's our director yeah. of ag on, on the podcast, the last one we just did. And great person, great guy, farmer, knows what he's doing. Uh, yeah. Well-connected, obviously, with Corteva as well. Just just a wonderful person. But you watch what he's able to do and guide for the state. And then I ran into, uh, two weeks ago, I happened to run into Mitch Daniels here in town. Oh. Amazing yeah. guy. Great guy. He stops, he talks to you, but you think about the work he did as governor and also for Purdue. We this is a really great place to live. So I didn't mean to make this a commercial for Indiana, but I'd be remiss if I didn't discuss it, given that you're at Corteva, we both live here. There's a lot of reasons to do business and work in Indiana. There's other great states, but Indiana, from a business perspective and a lifestyle perspective and employing people and, and the things that we do, I, I really haven't found something better. And I'm not sure that there is. Well, and sometimes people are like, oh, Indianapolis, that's got to be boring. And I'm like, uh, no, it's not boring. I mean, the, the if you're boring, is, it's going to be boring. Maybe totally, totally. And like, let's let's not be remiss. There's no mountains and there is no ocean in Indiana. However, we you have two ports though, completely. And we right. have a a great airport and we have professional sports. We have great restaurants. Not just in Indianapolis, across the state. I mean, yes. our, I mean, there is my favorite restaurant right now is in North Vernon in Jennings County, Indiana. Okay, like, there's there's great restaurants. Which one is that? That let's plug it. It's Crimson Oak. It's down downtown, um, on the square. I mean, it's uh, I mean, honestly, my son took his girlfriend to dinner there before prom a few weeks ago. It's, oh, wow. It's not white tablecloth. But you can go get a great meal, support a local business. Um, we keep going back. We love it. But that's what I'm saying. It's not just Indian airports. Our small communities are thriving. Those downtowns are thriving because people want to support the local people. Um, so if you're looking, if you're looking for a place to put up a business, I'm always all in for Indiana. I agree. I, I don't think there's many bad places you can do do that in Indiana. I've lived in Westfield. I work in Westfield. I live in Howard County and Rucheville. I see that. You, you've got experience down there in, in the Columbus oh, wow. area. Amazing architecture, a lot of history there. It's, it's a it's a fun state. I just don't, I think part of me, I want to keep it a well-kept secret uh, so it could I stay this you. way. But there's another part of me is it's, it's really, it's a great place to live, work, and raise a family. And I do think it's worth calling out here. So you do have some other pursuits. We probably didn't get into the wine and the culinary, but you do do some other things in social media. So maybe briefly just tell us a little bit about that. And then I'll probably, ha that's probably what people want to hear. We'll probably have to have you back on to talk about what are some good wines? Where should we be eating? What should we be doing? But yeah. tell us a little bit about that side of Leah Beyer. Okay. So this, you know, I was an accidental food blogger really, because when I was in that 2009, 2010 time zone. And I was like, man, we got to do more on the internet. I started blogging. Well, then I realized that my passion for food was me finding people on the internet who were just looking for either recipes their kids would eat, easy to make recipes, or a great wine suggestion. My blog was born. So um, buyerbeware.net is my food blog. I don't know if I told you this, but I've had Farm White Drink, which is my cocktail yes. blog. Here's the thing about online businesses. People buy them. So I actually sold um, com to someone, and I'm going through a rebrand um, for buyer being where to buyer eat and drink. So all of my cocktails and wine suggestions and now travel suggestions, because my kids are old enough now that I've taken a lot of wine trips, um, 
locally across the world and can make suggestions. So now I'm getting text messages from people that I'm planning a trip to Wil Willamette Valley. Where should I go? What town should I stay in? So yes, um, I'm not just passionate about agriculture. I'm passionate about the food and drinks that come from agriculture. So I was excited to know Corteva has um, products to protect those grapevines. I yes. think I I need to do a field trip to make sure they're working properly. I agree. I keep, I keep teasing my boss that I need to go visit the grapes to make sure that the wine is going to be quality when they use our products to reduce fungus um, or insects or control yep. those weeds. So yeah, so I love talking about food, but then also the, the stories, the little messages about how our food is raised. You don't have to be afraid of your food. Um, the American ag industry is the best in the world, the safest in the world, and the highest quality in the world, period, end of story, hard stop. So for, we're going to put in the show notes some of the links. Uh, since you sold uh, farmwifedrinks.com, we'll we'll post the buyer beware. Yeah. Uh, net.net, net, and that's buyer eat and drinks. Uh, yep. I think this is a great thing to end on here, Leah, is I want to thank you, first of all, you represent Corteva really well. Obviously, they made a great choice bringing you on, and there's some really cool and nice things happening there. It's it's good to know you because you're an excellent advocate for our industry and a good communicator. So I want to say thank you for that and encourage our listeners to check out uh, your personal blogs on Eats and Drinks. As I do know that you give great advice for that. And just before we, we exit the podcast, is there anything else you'd like to share or say for our audience? Um, just continue to focus first of all, on your customer. I mean, that's where we sort of started talking about marketing communication. So whether it's my food blog, whether I'm trying to help a rep sell Pioneer, or I'm trying to help a retailer understand how to sell their CP products to the right audience, think about your customer, what motivates them, and how you continue to build a relationship and hence trust with them because people buy from people. And even if we buy it from the internet, you sort of alluded to the bush light thing. It only takes one mistake for us to lose trust in a brand. That's true. And to stop using it. So in everything you do, think about your customer and the view they would have. Because When we think about our customers, we serve ag advisors and retailers with Tranis and the Acre Ford technology and intelligence that we provide. What we're doing is we're providing tools so you can know and serve your customers much better. We wake up every day, that's all we do is we think about how do we help you understand the story of that acre, what's happening there. So if you wanna hear more about the story of your acre, go to tarannis.com or easier to spell and say, acreforward.com. This podcast can be found at acreforwardpodcast.com and you can get it anywhere podcasts are found. I wanna thank Leah Beyer for joining us on the Acre Forward Podcast where we're here to move every acre forward. Thank you again, Leah. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike.